this is just such a wonderful dream for all of us at the Institute to have a room filled with all of you here tonight. So thank you for joining us. It's a wonderful evening for the Institute for Action of Hate, and it's a wonderful evening that we have the opportunity to recognize our wonderful friend and colleague, Eva Lossman. So first, I would like to begin by introducing um, the Board of Advisors that I have the privilege to work with. And as I call out your names, Board of Advisors, I'd like you to stand and remain standing until everyone has been recognized. And then if you would hold your applause till the end, I would appreciate it. First of all, I would like to introduce um, Dr. James Beebe. He is a professor in the doctoral program in leadership studies here at Gonzaga University. Dr. Dennis Connors, who could not be here with us this evening, and Dennis is a professor in the Organizational Leadership Program in the School of Professional Studies here at Gonzaga University. George Critchlow, JD, who is a professor and is currently the Acting Interim Dean in the School of Law here at Gonzaga University. Uh, Dr. Kathy Canfield Davis, who is an instructor at the University of Idaho in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Joni Apinga, who is our editor-in-chief of our Journal of Hate Studies. Uh, Joni has really helped us a great deal to continue the annual publication of our journal. Dr. Deborah Booth, who is a professor in the School of Education. Our honored guest tonight, Dr. Eva Lossman. She's a community activist and a wonderful member to our committee. And I do have notes because I didn't want to forget anyone. Uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Vern McGee, who is one of our community activists. He was here in Spokane when we started, and he is currently uh, residing in Ellensburg, Washington. Of course, Jim Moore, who I introduced. Jan Pollock, who is a writer and community activist, who has been with us since the beginning. Mary Lou Reed, who is the chairman of the program committee for the Human Rights Education Institute in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and formerly an Idaho state senator. Dr. Raymond Reyes, who cannot be with us here tonight, he's the vice president of diversity here at Gonzaga University. Dr. Jerry Shepard, who is a professor in the School of Education. Ken Stern, who cannot be with us here tonight with the American Jewish Committee in New York. And Ken is a specialist in anti-Semitism and extremism and has been a wonderful consultant for us as we've gone through the past years. Seema Thorpe, who got sick today and cannot join us, who is the director of the Center for Community Action and Service Learning here at Gonzaga University. Brad Vile, who is a teacher at Lakeside High School in Fairfield, Washington. Brad is a Mandel Scholar for the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. Um, Ms. Heather Vadir, who is our doctoral student and graduate assistant who keeps us on track and reminds us of meetings, and we want to thank Heather. And last but not least, Dr. James Waller, who is the current Dean of Social Sciences and Cultural Studies at the Spokane Falls Community College. Please, a nice warm applause for all of these individuals. I was say, I'll turn it back to Jim. I'm going to be your MC tonight, so you'll see me a lot t tonight up here, bringing people forward. So thank you very much, Bobby. That was, wow, a lot of people on our board, with the, um, so, and they're wonderful people, and it takes a lot of work to make everything happen, and they really put a lot of time and dedication into it. And one of the things that I didn't point out was you all received a Journal of Hate Studies. We put that out every year, so you do receive, did receive one free copy of it, and we have seven, uh, seven volumes out, which if you want a hard copy, there's a charge, but you can also get it at our website where you can download them for free, the PDFs. And that's just go to gonzaga.edu slash against hate, and that'll take you to the journal so you can see what we've produced there. Uh, right now, I'm gonna, it's my pleasure to introduce Ken Toole, who's going to be our main speaker tonight. He is a commissioner for the Montana Public Service Commission and, a Monta and was a Montana senator for six years, representing Central Helena. He is also founder and program director of the Montana Human Rights Network. 
It's, which is a human rights advocacy organization dedicated to promoting equality, justice, and pluralism. He's the founder and chair of the Policy Institute, a Montana-based think tank that focuses on economic issues, including energy, taxation, health care, and corporate reform. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. I'm, I'm really happy to be here, and I want to give a special thanks to Father Hess for his uh, lightening up the moment. You always, when you're doing these things, kind of wonder what you could do to, to lighten things, and I appreciate his, uh, his faux pas. Kind of took the pressure off me. I, I want to add he's from Anaconda, Montana. Um, we're all like that. <laughs> so I... I thought what I'd do is talk a little bit about the uh, early days of the Montana Human Rights Network and give you an idea, and I, I hope the point uh, illustrates the importance of uh, some institutions uh, studying exactly what it is when we're talking about hate and hate groups and hate activity, uh, how that's affecting our communities. So taking you back to the mid-1980s, I worked as an investigator at the State uh, Human Rights Commission. Now the Human Rights Commission in Montana, like all other states, really is um, engaged in processing discrimination complaints. If someone feels like they weren't hired because of their gender, um, or was fired because of their age. That's what the investigators do, and that's, that's what my full-time job was. It was with the State Civil Rights Enforcement Agency. And uh, through that job and, and through a number, probably a couple of years, we began to get some phone calls talking about uh, these people who had showed up in communities predominantly in the northwestern corner of Montana, um, and it, very obvious, it, they were bleed outs essentially from uh, the Aryan Nations compound up in Hayden Lake and the Aryan Brotherhood. I think people may remember this period of time when uh, Richard Butler and his boys up there were pretty active. And so uh, my boss and I talked about uh, what does this mean? We really didn't have much to say when people would call except, you know, those white supremacists and uh, if you got fired, call us. Well, to make a long story short, uh, we did have, we were governed by a commission and that commission decided that uh, that they wanted to devote some staff time into figuring out what's going on and so that kind of fell to me. And so I started Number one, gathering information when people would call and they saw flyers or, or whatever was happening, I started gathering that information um, and trying to make uh, heads or tails out of what was happening, what were these folks doing. But predominantly, the individuals that we were seeing showing up in western Montana were essentially kind of covert operatives. Uh, they weren't engaged in real kind of community recruitment activities, though they were engaged in some of that kind of thing. Uh, but by and large, kind of paramilitary, and there was no doubt when you talked to these folks, you understood that white supremacy was really at their core. At about the same time, another interesting thing started happening in Montana, predominantly out in farm country. And remember, this is a period of time where uh, the farm crisis was in the news a lot. Those of us who live in farm communities know that it just kind of keeps going, but this was back in the 80s. There was lots of foreclosures uh, out in wheat country and cattle country. The eastern part of Montana, for those of you who don't know, western Montana, mining and timber, mountains and rivers, eastern Montana, prairie, plains, cows and wheat. Uh, very different kinds of communities. Uh, but these groups were showing up and they were very different. They were out there and they were talking um, in community meetings, they were organizing community, me community meetings, uh, actively trying to pull people into their organizations. Um, but at the end of the day, what they were talking about was an international Jewish banking conspiracy. These are the folks that, that we refer to as the patriots, um, white nationalist organizations, but looked very different than the uh, Aryan nations kinds of covert paramilitary organizations that we saw out of uh, uh, the Idaho Panhandle, Western Montana. These were populist, uh, they were aggressively recruiting, and they were not overtly white supremacist and anti-Semitic. You, you really, if you went to one of their meetings, maybe you'd pick that up, maybe you wouldn't, but certainly as people got more and more involved in those organizations, they were exposed to uh, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, white supremacy, and the whole nine yards. Well, this is all in the late 
1980s, and I'm doing this as like 5% of my total job, and the rest of the time I'm, I'm dealing with these discrimination complaints. And finally, 1987, uh, came over to Coeur d'Alene. Uh, there was a conference organized, I think Tony Stewart and Marshall Mend were very involved in organizing that, um, kind of uh, just to see what kind of information we were going to get. And at that conference, uh, it's kind of like a lot of things came together. Um, there were some speakers there, a fellow named Lenny Zeskin. I don't know if people know Lenny in this room, but he's got a new book out, uh, Blood and Politics, which is kind of a uh, 700 page march through the white supremacist movement back to the, the 40s and 50s. I encourage you uh, to pick that up to help Lenny's pocketbook, but also if you want to find out about these things, uh, no better source. Well, at that conference, in sitting down and talking with folks, what, what became apparent to me was this is all the same thing. I mean, the belief system, the ideology underneath it is exactly the same. The manifestation of it at the community level is very different, okay? That, that the goals and the activities of these activists that we were seeing were very different, but underneath it, uh, the philosophy was the same. And furthermore, they all met and talked with each other. There, there were gatherings where uh, they planned, they strategized, the militia movement, which subsequently became um, very, very well known nationally and, and tied to all kinds of rather bizarre incidents around the country, uh, really found its roots in this same ideology, uh, philosophy, religion, uh, social structure and analysis that these groups have developed over time and and frankly it has proven uh, the ideas underneath these groups has proven to be incredibly resistant despite uh, law enforcement pressure, despite community resistance, despite uh, community organizing, uh, these groups uh, tend to go through cycles. Uh, I, I would submit, and I don't have time to get into talking about it a lot tonight, but armed guys showing up at presidential rallies, teabaggers, birthers, et cetera, et cetera, very similar to a period of time that we were saying in the mid 80s to early 90s. Um, make a long story short, we decided that the strategy for dealing with this was not a state agency going in and trying to deal with it as an entity of government. We decided that the strategy that was most effective was to organize individuals at the community level to confront uh, and, and speak out about the ideas being proposed by these organizations. Um, and so we founded the Montana Human Rights Network and at its inception we viewed the Montana Human Rights Network as essentially an anti-white supremacist organization. The, the, the things that we had seen, the ideas that were espoused, what we were concerned about uh, was essentially white supremacy um, and, and racism. We didn't connect a lot of the other dots uh, that are out there to be connected. Um, and during this period, we were organizing local affiliates. We had six or seven around the state. Uh, and all of a sudden, I got a call from uh, Lenny Zeskin saying, um, now there's this fellow I, you really need to, to meet and talk with. His name is Floyd Cochran. Now, anybody in here remember Floyd Cochran? I know Tony's going there. <laughs> Floyd was uh, kind of the security chief and recruitment guy, and uh, I don't know, he did all kinds of stuff uh, for the Aryan nations. And Floyd, according to Floyd's story, had an epiphany. I, I really, to my mind, I don't care but he came out of the area nation and was sleeping in the park in Coeur d'Alene or something like that. And Lenny said, you guys got to work with Floyd. You got to get him out. Got to have him talk to groups. And I said, yeah, right. Call me back later. I mean, we all knew about Floyd and he was one of the more visible uh, people in the area nation. We really didn't have a lot of interest in dealing with him. Well, to make a long story short, we did end up uh, doing a lot of uh, work with Floyd, and, and it was difficult um, on a lot of fronts. Uh, but we, there were a couple things. Number one, events, uh, community events, there was very, very few speakers had the kind of credibility that Floyd had. One of the things that we did require, and this again was at Lenny Zeskin's insistence, every talk that he gave, he had to begin with an apology uh, to the people who had been 
essentially terrorized and targeted by his organization, which at first he was quite resistant to it because Floyd is many things, uh, but he has a very healthy ego and he was quite resistant uh, to, to beginning with that kind of mea culpa, but that was the gig and he got it, he started doing it. But the other thing that happened is I ended up driving around with Floyd a lot because Montana has a lot of space between the little towns and you, you sit there and you can only turn up the Grateful Dead for so long and eventually you have to start talking to Floyd. <laughs> and so I talked to Floyd about what he did and how he did it and he's a very thoughtful guy and he understood uh, really well how he recruited and he understood how you target people who are on the margins, how you unite uh, people through fear and anger and hatred and how you built organizations and structures about around those things uh, and how you went into communities and you didn't start with your anti-Semitic conspiracies and you didn't start with your hardcore racism, you started by talking about spotted owls and the economy, uh, gun rights, uh, gay stuff, abortion, uh, trying, to, trying to come in on these threads of contention in community. And then once you had established a meeting of the minds and some common, common purpose, then you began this kind of process of indoctrination. Uh, this process of moving people deeper into a movement dynamic and turning them into activists. And that's, that's really where we started getting a, an understanding of, well, you know, there's a lot more to this than just guys uh, walking around with Nazi uniforms and Klan hoods. There, there's some thoughtful stuff going on here. But more importantly, it is trading on and it is organizing around tensions and distension in communities where there's anger, where there's fear, uh, you know, roll back to tea beggars, et cetera, et cetera. That those, those are the roads that these folks travel. And to the extent they can grab someone, radicalize them, uh, and encourage them, a la Tim McVeigh into some kind of, of dramatic action, so much the better because that's all about destabilizing the status quo, which is what at the end of the day they're all about. Well, during this period of time, we are essentially at the Human Rights Network still um, uh, an anti-racist group and that's how we defined ourselves. And then we began working in Billings, Montana. Uh, there was a little group of Klan guys down there, a little group of, of uh, Church of the Creators, little, uh, every little flavor in the hate movement kind of was showing up in Billings. Well, we came to understand later that wasn't accidental, um, that there were connections between these folks. But we really began to watch closely how they were using issues, the literature being uh, disseminated in the community in part of their recruitment efforts, uh, never mentioned race hardly ever got into anti-Semitic uh, conspiracy stuff, though there, wa there was plenty of that. Uh, but more commonly, it was about homosexuality, it was about abortion, it was about uh, anti-government gun, gun rights kinds of things. And at that point, our group began to redefine itself and think, well, what are we really about? How do we, uh, how do we propose to do the work we do and how do we discern I mean, we had this cool definition of a hate group, you know, biological imperative uh, combined with some kind of theological or, or scientific rationalization for why white people are God's chosen or genetically superior, whatever. Very handy for us, but, but it wasn't fitting when, when the mobilization and the activity that we were saying was targeting gays in the community of Billings. Uh, isolated, uh, group already has got a lot of things to be really concerned about just trying to live day to day in a Western community. It wasn't fitting for us. And so we really began to, to redefine and think through our mission as having more to do with democratic values and democratic processes and democratic principles uh, than just defining ourselves by being anti hate or anti-white supremacy or anti-racism. And it was a major shift for us because it made our group move into uh, some other arenas, uh, the political arena. We had uh, very organized attacks on local schools, not coming out of the white supremacist movement, uh, but coming out of what's now, I think, commonly referred to as the religious right. At its core, fundamentally anti-democratic strategies were being used of concealing, running people for school boards, concealing what was going on. 
and also targeting of gays, abortion, all of that uh, filtering up. Well, at that point, we went from wearing a white hat to becoming pretty controversial uh, liberals. And, you know, controversial liberals in Montana. I'll point out I've been elected to the state senate. I'll point out I've been elected to the state public service commissions. Uh, and there's more than just me. We don't bunch up anywhere. We kind of keep some separate space. So one hand grenade can't get us all. Um, but. You know, it, it, it was a redefinition of our purpose. Uh, and to give you an example of the other area where, where that played out in Montana, and I think we've seen it in this area of the world, was targeting of environmentalists. We had a period of, of time uh, when environmentalists uh, literally had to be fearful about their safety. Threats at home in the middle of the night, um, really raucous meetings where people were threatened and shouted down. And so we got into that again because of our focus on democratic values and our belief that you can't have democracy if part of the consequence of speaking your mind is fearing for your life. It just doesn't work very well. That you've got to have people around saying this isn't okay. Um, all of that was a really long path and very confusing. Um, and, and this is why I think it is so important that we have an organized interdisciplinary study of what is uh, hate. I mean, what are the activities that these groups uh, engage in? How do uh, hate groups, et cetera, et cetera, operate in communities? And what's at stake uh, in communities? I can tell you that uh, through the path that I've walked on this, it's very much catch as catch can. You stumble, uh, and there hadn't been until the formation of this group any systematic, organized attempt to look at what are we talking about here and, and a forum for discussion. I mean, the, the most I get, although there are some great publications listed in there, and you can get any of them from the Montana Human Rights Network, but there, there really was no opportunity as a practitioner of this stuff uh, to, to really look at it in an interdisciplinary way other than these conferences. And conferences are great, but they're two days, or maybe three days, uh, where you meet some great people and, and then you can call them up. But there is no real thinking about how do we present this information, how do we tell people what's at stake. And that's why this organization is important, and that's why I really appreciate you coming tonight and hope that you all have your checkbooks out and open at all times for this organization. So thank you very much. I was a little too involved with the dessert, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so I hope you all started to eat the dessert, it's really good, uh, just in case you haven't. Um, I want to next bring up George Critchlow, it's my honor to introduce him. He is a founding member of the Institute for Action Against Hate. He's also the acting uh, dean of the law school and he is a professor there. So please welcome George Critchlow. Thank you, Jim and uh, Ken. Where, where are you, Ken? Here. I've not met you, but that was it was nice <laughs> nice to meet you, and uh, I've heard a lot about you, and I know about your work, and thank you for coming over uh, from Montana and joining us uh, joining us tonight. Uh, I'll try to be uh, fairly brief here. I think what I have to say uh, really complements what uh, Ken was talking about. I want to talk about what our story is and how we started. We often get questions about, you know, what what inspired. Uh, the Institute for Action Against Hate, how did you guys happen to get organized and for what reasons here at Gonzaga? And the story is pretty simple. Uh, back in the mid-90s, we had a rash of hate incidents here on our campus, some at the law school, targeting mostly uh, people of color, in fact, African Americans. Now this was happening at the same time and in the same context as the entire Inland Northwest region was experiencing hate, uh, both in the form of perhaps random incidents of hate, racial harassment, uh, other forms of harassment targeting gays. Um, it, it was organized hate in the Aryan Nations and the other groups that Ken mentioned who are operating in Montana or elsewhere. And in some ways, at least for me and many of my colleagues, uh, some of which are sitting in this room, everything sort of stopped in the mid-90s. And we asked ourselves, this is happening on our campus. 
a Jesuit campus, a campus that's dedicated in part to fighting for social justice and fighting for equality and finding ways to understand uh, what it is that contributes to the common good and contributes to social justice and, and teaching about those things. And we asked ourselves the question, what can we do that makes a meaningful difference and that can make a meaningful contribution to the fight against hate that perhaps isn't already being done elsewhere. Now, we recognize all the wonderful, the great work, and the enormous efforts that were being made by other human rights organizations, including our friends here from North Idaho who inspired and organized the Kootenai County Task Force on Human Relations, the local churches here in the Spokane area, other community organizations that were fully engaged in the fight against hate. But we, we asked, what is it that we can do that might be a little bit different as a, as a Jesuit school and, and as a university, as, as a place of higher learning? So we got some national experts together. One of them was Morris Dees, who you all know from the Southern Poverty Law Center. One of them was Ken Stern, who's been on our board for years and years now, but helped very much articulate and inspire the initial impetus that started the Institute for Action Against Hate. Ken, as was uh, pointed out previously, is the uh, national specialist on hate and e extremism uh, with the American Jewish Committee in, in New York. We also talked, and this was hugely important to us, to Bill Wasmuth, who you all remember was formerly a Catholic priest and later started the uh, Northwest Coalition Against Malicious Harassment based in Seattle. He also inspired and helped organize the Kootenai County Task Force on Human Relations and undertook some of those uh, initial efforts in the 80s and 90s against organized hate in the Northern Idaho community. Bill Wasmuth got to us and he said, the one thing that you need to do at Gonzaga and if you don't do it at Gonzaga, it's going to happen somewhere else. He said, if for no other reason, I'm going to market this to other colleges and universities. We need a place that is the venue, the locus, for the interdisciplinary study of hate, a place that has the resources and the motivation to bring together the discipline so we can really look at this question, as Ken was talking about. Why is it that people hate? Where does it come from? How does it manifest itself? What are the strategies for fighting hate? How do we organize in communities? And importantly for us as a university, how do we teach about hate? And how do we inculcate those values and that consciousness so that students commit their lives to fighting hate as part of the broader and the larger goal of fighting injustice? So we listened to these people, we sat down, and we decided we're going to start this thing called the Institute for Action Against Hate. We got some criticism and some flack. Some people in the community said, well, you should call yourself the Institute for Brotherly Love, and people will write checks a lot faster and more frequently if you do that. But we said, no, this is our focus. This is our mission, to do something that's different, that will make a contribution, and it will allow all the disciplines, all the fields, to get together and have a conversation and talk about hate in a way that perhaps historically really can make a difference. So we brought this idea to form the Institute for Action Against Hate to the Gonzaga Board of Trustees. I think it was in December 1997. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was important to get the recognition of the university and the approval to go ahead with the organization that we didn't ask for a bunch of money. We just asked for their approval and recognition. And the board gave us the approval and they supported us and in fact have underwritten us to a certain extent over the years with respect to our projects and our goals and our initiatives and activities. So what have we done that time? For the most part, it's been on the basis of volunteers efforts. It's really a volunteer-run organization. 
We're trying to make the transition from a volunteer organization to a budget-based organization so that we can compensate our staff and remunerate people for the hard work they do and accomplish the kinds of things that are sometimes, as you all know, very difficult to do only through volunteers. But in any event, we've done several things and I think we've accomplished some major things that have made a difference and that we hope will carry into the future. One of those is we've now published, as was mentioned earlier, earlier the seventh annual volume of our uh, <clears throat> journal uh, of hate studies. And that's an interdisciplinary journal that gives scholars, human rights activists, and others an opportunity to publish scholarly work and have an interdisciplinary conversation about hate and strategies for fighting hate. That's both online and it's also available in print version. And I think some of you have uh, copies at your table. You can take a look at that. We had the first international conference on hate studies several years ago here at Gonzaga, and we're now preparing for the second follow-up co international conference on hate studies that's bring, that is intended to bring people together from throughout the country and, and abroad to continue this conversation about what the field of hate studies looks like and where we should move into the future. We are now teaching a course at Gonzaga that's very innovative, very different. I think it's the only course of its kind in the country called Why People Hate. And it's taught by several people from different departments, from different disciplines, from different schools coming together to look at why people hate. We want this to lead to a certificate that students can uh, obtain uh, based on their effort and their desire to concentrate on this area of hate studies so that they can graduate and they can actually specialize and have something that recognizes that specialty as they go out and they look for work and they start doing social justice in their respective communities. We've, had, we've done several other uh, projects. We had something that was very, very successful some years ago. It was the, Anse, uh, the Anne Frank exhibit, which brought together some 25,000 people to tour this exhibit. Most of those people were students whose tour of the exhibit was arranged through uh, the local schools and the local school district. Um, there's a number of other things that we have done and that we are doing, but primarily what I want to leave you with is this notion that lots of volunteers got together here at Gonzaga and decided that this was important. And it could have been an idea that we might have left behind. It might have disappeared in the competition for money and all the other pri priorities uh, that compete in a, in a university system and in a larger community. But people in this room and, and those who were not able to be here with us uh, stayed with us. And, and this thing has survived and it is going to move into the future. Uh, People in this room are here to support this because it's important and because of the issue, the, the issue of hate does not go away. It will require constant vigilance so it doesn't come back in some new and novel manifestation. We need to be responsible. We need to make commitments and renew that commitment constantly to fight against hate. So you think, well, hopefully we've done enough work, we've worked hard enough, we've we solved the problem or it's gone away. And, and that will not be the case in our lifetime. So I thank you all for coming, but before I quit, I want to thank a few people. I can't thank, uh, the board was already recognized, and thank you for that, Bobby. But, but let me recognize a few other people, uh, and, and also to thank them and give you an opportunity to, to join with me in my personal thanks to these people. And I'm just going to limit, because the list is too long, to past uh, or current directors and chairs of our advisory board who really motivated this thing and, and has made it go and, and, and continues to make it go now and, and into the future. There was Bill Wasmuth himself. Bill, as you know, is now, is now deceased. Uh, he died several years ago. But without Bill, I don't know that we'd be together. You know, Bill has made such a difference in so many individual lives and in and, and organizations, and, and, and that includes us, the Institute for Action Against Hate. Uh, Bill was our first chair. Bob Bartlett, who is here tonight. Bob was, uh, was the chair of our board. Thank you, Bob. Nice to see you again. Uh, I don't see Bob uh, too often. Uh, James Beebe was uh, the director 
uh, one of the first directors uh, of the Institute. This is all volunteer stuff. Jerry Shepard gave us how many years, Jerry? Five years? Six years? Uh, as, as a volunteer, on top of her, her, her already uh, complex and extensive duties here at Gonzaga through the School of Education. Bobby Leg, our current chair, who has been with us now for a few years in that capacity, uh, done terrific work, including helping with tonight's dinner. And Jim Moore, our, our acting current uh, acting director or interim director. Uh, Jim, thank you uh, for your efforts. You've, you've really made us all confident that this organization is viable and, and has a life going forward. Uh, let me also recognize the long-standing support of Raymond Reyes. He was mentioned earlier. Uh, Raymond, who's not with us tonight, is the, is the Gonzaga Assistant Vice President for Diversity. Um, I also want to thank, uh, in particular, and she was recognized earlier, Joey, uh, Joni Apinga, who is our tireless editor of the uh, Journal of Hate Studies, uh, which now is in its, its seventh edition, published on a yearly institute, uh, yearly basis by the institute. Finally, let me recognize uh, other people who are responsible for making uh, tonight a success. Bobby, who we've already mentioned, she's our current chair. Jim Moore, who we've mentioned as our, as our director. Uh, Jan Pollock, Jan, where are you? You've done a terrific job. Thanks so much for what you've done for the Institute, for the community. Seema Thorpe, Seema's apparently sick tonight, but she worked on making tonight's event possible. And Heather Veter. Heather is an assistant working with Jim uh, as a graduate assistant on behalf of the Institute. Thank you for your efforts, Heather. Uh, let me finish by saying that we are a volunteer organization, but in this effort to transition to a different kind of organization that has a regular budget and is able to accomplish even more, please consider us and include us in the decisions you make about which uh, charitable organizations you might like to contribute to. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, George. I do want to mention, uh, recognize one other person who is here tonight. Uh, I think it's very important to recognize her. Mayor Werner is here, and we're very appreciative of her presence here. So let's thank her for coming. As we know, it's very important to have uh, not just ourselves in this room and activists who are challenging hate, but also our politicians who understand and recognize that this is an important issue to deal with and confront. So now we're going to start moving into the part of the program about Eva that we're all here to celebrate. So to do that, we're bringing up a very good friend, Jerry Shepard, who was director of the Institute for five years. She's currently an associate professor in education, and she flies all over the place and teaches everywhere. She's in Canada. I don't know how she does it. <laughs> I am so delighted to be here. We have talked for such a long time for the Institute for Action Against Hate about having a fundraiser. And little did we know, we were thinking about Bill Moyers and Bill Clinton and Nelson Mandela and all these people that would have been impossible to get here. And then all of a sudden someone said, why don't we honor Eva? And it's was right here, right in front of us the whole time, and we didn't see it. And it was such a wonderful idea which really just came to us in May. And um, as George and Jim and everyone else have said, there have been a lot of people who have worked hard to put this together. How many of you know Eva? Raise your hand if you know Eva. <laughs> You're so lucky to know Eva. We all are, but not everyone in this room knows Eva. And of course, also I'd like to say we're so lucky to have not just Eva here, but also her sons Richard and Joel sitting right at this front table. But it's so great to look around and see so many people who um, have been in Eva's life and who love her. Her doctors, her friends, her people, many, many people from the temple. And once you get to know Eva, uh, our great friends from Coeur d'Alene that have come over here, once you get to know her, you don't want to let go of her. Some of you, however, have not yet met Eva and I hope that you will get a chance to do this. But for you, we want to introduce you to her through a short video clip that's part of a documentary that's being produced by Lee Taylor and videographer Gordon Grove, and I hope you'll get a chance to meet them later tonight. The board of directors of the Institute for Action Against Hate 
has reviewed the introduction section of the video and the project plans. We're impressed with the production quality of this project and support the really good work that's being done. We believe that this documentary will be an important way to ensure that Eva's story will continue to be told. Following this dinner, there'll be an opportunity for those of you who are interested in supporting this project to um, go to the information table in the foyer. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Eva. Thank you all for coming. I'm delighted to see you. I'm delighted to see you all here. Thank you so very much. I have a very short story of my life that I want to read to you. Shalom. Shalom. I am honored to be here. Louder. Okay. <laughs> I will start all over again. Shalom. Shalom. I'm honored to be here with my dear family and friends. I have first-hand understanding of concept of hate. Having survived the Holocaust and lost most of my family at the time, being in concentration camp taught me never to give up hope and never to say I can't. I wasn't a hero in camp as I was hoping to survive with my brothers. My younger brother's dream was to become a medical doctor, and I wanted to survive in order to help him. To that end, I was a passive prisoner, not wanting to step out of line. I saw what happened to people who took a stand. To an older inmate, I said, I had a dream that we were liberated. And he said, you young people believe in dreams. In truth, I did dream that we were liberated on a beautiful crisp day. We were actually liberated on January 17, 1945, which was a crisp day and we walked on snow. I continued to dream while in camp. One of my Gentile co-workers asked me if I could make a brassiere for her daughter and a shirt for her son. I had no idea how to do it. But I said yes, because the idea to get paid in bread made me say yes, and I am thankful for that. I never said I can't, and I hope I instilled this message into my children. When I was liberated, I had a utopian dream that there won't be any more war, but this dream has not come true yet. Although, I had every reason to hate my captors and my murderers of my family and friends. I decided long ago that it isn't worth it. Instead of continuing to hate, I decided to speak up on the perils of hate. We can't be in love with everybody, but we have to have respect and take a stand for each other. I, I know you heard this before, but I'm repeating it. Pastor ne Martin Nimor left a wonderful legacy when he said, when they deported the Jews, I did not say anything because I wasn't a Jew. When they deported the socialists again, I said nothing as I wasn't a socialist. When they deported the homosexuals, I was quiet because I wasn't a homosexual. But when they came to deport me, there was no one left to speak for me. The moral of his legacy is that we are our brother's keepers. Therefore, we have to stay, take a stand for the right causes. Many times I was asked why I started life again. My answer was, why not? Hitler and the Nazis would have succeeded without me starting over. My late husband and I started life again. I have three wonderful contributing sons and they have their own families and they have three wonderful grandchildren. The work of fighting hate is not over. We need to work together. My challenge to you and your children is to carry on the message of hope to the future generations. I say to you shalom again, and I want to thank the Institute for Action Against Hate for bestowing these honors upon me. I opened my remarks with the word shalom, which in Hebrew means hello. 
I am closing my remarks with the word shalom, which has a second meaning, peace. My wish is that there will be peace for all humankind. Eva is a natural born teacher. There are several of you in here who have been teachers in classes where Eva's come in and talked. From Shirley Grossman, who taught pre-kindergartners in kinder music, to Sunday school class, to Brad Viley, who has taught in uh, Lakeside High School in Plummer, Idaho, uh, many other high school classes, Julie Scott at East Valley, um, sure, certainly you've been to Eastern Washington University, to Whitworth. She's come to some of the classes in the doctoral program at uh, Gonzaga University. In fact, a class I love to teach is on leadership and resilience, and I always started off with Eva and her story, and the students are just mesmerized by her and want to stay in contact with her for a long time. I could go on and on, and I'm not going to go on and on about her because um, I think that, for one thing, you can read a really wonderful wonderful biography that's written, that's part of the program. But also, I hope for all of you that you do have a chance at some time to meet Eva personally. Because to know this woman is to love her. She is, and I've said this before, she's also taught in Canada. She came with me one time to Canada to teach. Um, she is not just a national, but she's an international treasure. And we are so lucky to have her. And on behalf of the Institute for Action Against Hate, Pardon me. I would like to present you, Eva. I hope I don't drop it. With the first annual Eva Lossman Take Action Against Hate Award. In grateful appreciation for your many years of outstanding service in the fight against hate. And this is the first of our annual dinners that we'll have, and Eva is the first recipient of this award, and certainly the most deserving person that I know. So that's Let's give another round of applause for an incredible woman. There's another person who I would like to recognize before we leave tonight, and that is Vianne Smith, who's the president of the NAACP. We really appreciate her being here tonight also. So let's give her a round for being here and all her work that she does. So I want to thank you all for being here tonight. It's wonderful to see all of you. And I think one of the things to take from and remember from tonight is that this is about taking action against hate. And Eva Lossman has done an incredible job of doing that. Yet we also need to realize that all of us can challenge hate when it happens. And it can happen in small ways in our lives if we choose to challenge a joke that's told, if we choose to challenge someone who is making a stereotypical remark about someone else. It's important that at those small levels, at those lower levels, we start challenging it. Because it's from there that we start to see hate grow and fester and develop. So there are things that we can do uh, on our own individual level. And one of the things to realize, and that's close, is that many of you may have heard, and some of you may not, since you're from out of town, about the, uh, the attack, uh, not the attack on, but her, the invasion of her home of Rachel Dalazel. She uh, had a lot of uh, stuff stolen. She had a noose put on her. Her, uh, porch, so she was the victim of a hate crime, and that was only a few blocks from Gonzaga University. So we need to bring this full circle to what's happening in Spokane, in uh, our area, in the greater area of North Idaho also, because we are beginning to see an increase in hate crimes and attacks on people and criticism of people of difference in many ways. So please, when you leave tonight, don't think it's just about um, honoring certain individuals up here, it's about what we can do ourselves ourselves when we leave here and what action we can do to be supportive of those who have been victims of hate crime. There are a few little announcements I want to make before you leave. One is that there are a group of individuals in the community, which starts with uh, Addie uh, Goldberg. If she could stand up for a second, that would be great. 
She's right here, and she's taken the lead on creating the Eva Lastman Scholarship Fund. It's created to honor the message that Eva has dedicated her life to delivering, having spoken to countless school-age children, church groups, and community service organizations. Eva has repeated her message of tolerance and respect for each other, regardless of race, religion, sexual orientation, or political orientation, young in spirit, Eva feels a special bond to the young adults in her world. The Eva Lossman Scholarship is dedicated to keeping Eva's message alive. Young adults ages 18 to 25 are eligible to apply for funds to support studies, activities, and travel devoted to her message of human rights and tolerance. And again, you can contact Ada Goldberg for more information on that. The Institute is also proud to join with the Northwest Alliance for Responsible Media to put on a Generation M, it's called. It's Misogyny in Media and Culture. It's a film that is being shown at the uh, Magic Lantern on Monday, October 26th at 7 p.m. And it basically tracks the destructive dynamics of misogyny across a broad and disturbing range of media phenomena. So please, if you have time, uh, go see that, and there'll be a community discussion afterwards, and we're proud to help sponsor that. So on that note, I want to thank you all for being here. It's been wonderful to meet many of you for the first time for me, and I hope to see you again sometime. Thank you very much.